We're now on Radio 4, a sequel to Roy Horneman's book, Israel Rank, a novel which perhaps became best known as an Ealing comedy with Alec Guinness. This time, Alistair McGowan plays a whole new generation of aristocrats in Kind Hearts and Coronets, Like Father, Like Daughter by David Spicer, which also stars Natalie Walter as Unity. Someone once said... A taste for irony has kept more hearts from breaking than a sense of humour. For it takes irony to appreciate the joke which is on oneself. As I sit here, in the cell once occupied by my late father, I cannot help agreeing with this sentiment. Because as the chill evening draws in, on this, my last night on earth, I am resolved to keep my chin up and show that in spite of everything the world has thrown at me, I truly am my father's daughter. I am the Countess, Lady Gascoigne of Chalfont, although I was born Unity Holland. My mother, Sibella Holland, and my father, Louis Gascoigne, the 10th Earl of Chalfont, were unhappily married, and even more unhappily not to each other. Poor Papa was cruelly and unjustly accused of murdering dear Mama's husband. Happily, though, at the eleventh hour he was spared hanging for a murder he hadn't committed. But unhappily, at the twelfth hour, he was hanged for the eighth that he had. As Louis, Earl of Chalfont, dropped through the trap, Whatever hopes that Sibella had for my future were dashed. His legal spouse, Lady Edith Gascoigne, inherited the title before he had stopped spinning and then set to vilifying mother until she was painted out of the picture like poor Branwell Bronte. By the time of my arrival in this world, some eight months later, she had been banished to rented rooms in Tooting. Lady Edith then set herself straight to the task of replenishing the Gascoigne family stock. The marriage took place on Wednesday, March the 11th, 1914, at St. Uhtred's Chapel, Chalfont, between the Countess Lady Edith Gascoigne of Chalfont and Colonel the Viscount Amersham. And she certainly wasted no time. On the 12th of December, 1914, to the Countess Lady Edith Gascoigne of Chalfont and Colonel the Viscount Amersham, a son and heir, Louis Philip Francis. And then, with hardly a pause for breath... On the 13th of September, 1915, to the Countess Lady Edith Gascoigne of Chalfont and Colonel the Viscount Amersham, a son, Henry Arthur Kitchener. Having done his bit for wife and family, the hapless Viscount Amersham did the same for Queen and Country and was promptly slaughtered on the first day of the Somme, along with 60,000 of his fellow countrymen. However, Lady Edith was on a single-minded mission and she swiftly bagged husband number three. The marriage of the Countess Lady Edith Gascoigne of Chalfont to Lord Cameron of Fairfax took place on the 1st of August, 1916. And nine months and one day later... To the Countess Lady Edith Gascoigne of Chalfont and her husband, Lord Cameron of Fairfax, twin sons... Adelbert and Ugtred. On the 3rd of February 1918, to the Countess Lady Edith Gascoigne of Chalfont and Lord Cameron of Fairfax, a son. Marmaduke, brother to Louis, Henry, Adelbert and Ugtred. She had her science, but having come through the Great War with ne'er a scratch, Lord Cameron succumbed to the Great Influenza outbreak of 1918. Those who knew Lady Edith may have been forgiven for thinking he'd taken the easy way out. But then, quite out of the blue, Lady Edith stunned the world by marrying again. This time for love to a poet and commoner. Astonishingly, this marriage lasted for some 18 years until he too died. Quite possibly of relief. When their son Ronald had become the sixth obstacle to my ever gaining my rightful position in the world... Poor Mama quite gave up on life. She languished for years before finally going to join Father, wherever he had ended up. I wrote to Lady Edith, 
conveying my sad news along with Mama's final dying wish. I sent it with a small bottle of Madeira wine, a friendly gesture, I thought, and asked that Lady Edith thought of my mother as she drank it. If I imagined this would soften her Gascoigne heart, I was swiftly disabused. Dear Miss Whoever You Claim to Be, I must confess myself puzzled and vexed by your letter. You inform me that the woman you call your mother has died. Well, I can only hope the experience has been morally improving for her. As for her extraordinarily impertinent desire to be interred here at Chalfont, next to the Tenth Earl, well, this is quite out of the question. Not only as a commoner does she have no claim on such an honour, but the Gascoigne crypt is preternaturally overflowing, due in no small part to the homicidal exertions of the Tenth Earl himself. This entire subject is both painful and distasteful to me, and therefore this correspondence is now closed. With even this final small comfort denied her from the family, I resolved to do whatever I could to help my mother rest in peace. Can everyone hear me? Yes. Clear. Mm -hmm. Good. Chalfon Castle dates back to the early 12th century and has been the ancestral home of the Gascoigne family for 300 years, Ooh. since the first Ooh. Earl won it from Charles II in a game of cards. <laughs> <laughs> now, I must ask you all to keep together and not stray away from the party, as Chalfont is still home to the family and they don't wish to be disturbed by hoi polloi. Now, we're going to see the magnificent sunken garden, passing as we do the picturesque chapel of St. Uchtreds, where generations of Gascoigns have been laid to rest. So, this way, please. As Hoy Poloi moved off to gawp at how the other half lived, I slipped away from them, and clutching Mother in a peak green biscuit tin, made my way into the family chapel. For the first time in my life, I was alone. <sighs> in my ancestral family home. Our Father, which art in heaven, I commend the soul of your servant, Sibella. Please look kindly upon her, Lord. I say, hey, what's your game? You can't be here. It's private, not part of the tour. I'm sorry, I must have got lost. Lost? What do you mean? I mean separated from the tour. What's that? What? That thing you've got there. That tin you've got there. What is it? Nothing. Doesn't look like nothing to me. Or me. Come on, hand it over. No, it's mine. And this chapel is ours. Yours? We live here. It's our house. Your gas coins? Can you believe this woman's nerve? No, I can't. Nor me. You're the twins? You're Adalbert and Uhtred? No, I'm Adalbert and he's Uhtred. But more to the point, who the blazes are you? Me? <laughs> I'm nobody. You're trespassing in our chapel with a tin. You're in big trouble. Hold her, Udrid. No! No! Got her, Adelbert. Uh, oh, oh. Now let's see what's in this tin of yours, shall we? Careful, though, it could be anything. No! Ah! Oh. <gasps> what is it? My eyes! It's gunpowder. She's an anarchist. A Bolshevik! No, I'm not. It's my mother. She doesn't look at all well. I've just brought her from Woking. Woking? Crematorium. I wanted to scatter her. Scatter her? We can't have ordinary members of the public scattering their mothers all over our property. The very thought of it makes me... Ashen. Quite. But please, she's my mother. She's litter. That's what she is. And there's only one place for litter. And that's in the bin. No! Yeah! Now, madam, run along and think yourself lucky and hoi polloi. I thought I would cry, but no tears came. As I stood in that cold family chapel, my family chapel, I made a solemn vow to the bones of my father. As these people had beaten me and my loved ones, so would I beat them. I would beat them into the ground. But I would do worse than beat them. I would join them. I would be a Gascoigne. And my father's daughter. 
The letter's patent, which set out the original terms of inheritance of the Gascoigne family, included two small, but to me, highly significant clauses. The first is that, in terms of succession, females have absolute equality with their male relations. The second states that the title is inherited by heirs of the body natural, legitimate, or otherwise. This has been an extremely useful loophole throughout the family's history, given its abnormally high proportion of bastards. And it now meant that there were only seven obstacles standing between me and my rightful inheritance. Louis, Henry, the hateful twins Adalbert and Uptred, Marmaduke, young Ronald, and Lady Edith herself. I decided the first of all would be the twins, and I set to tracking them down. England at that time was alive with political idealism. The reports of German atrocities which filled our daily newspapers had stirred many young men to political action, and Adalbert and Utrecht Gascoigne were no exception. So I made my way to one of their public meetings to watch them in action. leaders <laughs> <laughs> yes two two for the price of one twice the leadership twice the fascism so reject his British union of fascists <laughs> and join our fascist union of Britain become a grey shirt more power more strength less laundry no. yeah. I think this is going rather well Yes, better than Dolston. It was crystal clear that if I didn't do something to put an end to this pair soon, the citizens of Shoreditch would do it for me. However, before I could turn my resolve to action, history intervened. It appeared that the previous war to end all wars had been simply a curtain raiser, and the outbreak of the Encore in September 1939 saw Adalbert and Utrecht Gascoigne interned by the authorities as a danger to the national good, which was no good to me, as they were removed from my clutches. The world was once more plunged into death and destruction. I offered to do my bit for king and country, but, rather short-sightedly in my case, women were deemed incapable of killing, and I was sent to the women's land service. And there I was, working in the fields one sunny day in 1940, when out of the clear blue sky, fate decided to drop in. Look out below! Ah! Ah! Oh! Are you all right? Did you see that? What? Ruddy Messerschmitt. I just lined her up in my sights and forgot about his blooming pal behind me. It's just not cricket. Are you hurt? Hurt? Of course I'm not hurt. Oh, I lie still. Oh. Let me have a look at that leg. There's nothing wrong with my ballet. Ow! Be careful. Don't be such a baby. Baby? I've just jumped out of a blasted hurricane. And squashed a load of my sugar beet in the process. Damn your flaming sugar beet. <sighs> oh. oh! Oh, it looks like it's broken. Damn them. Blast and... Oh. I say be a pal. You haven't got a gasper on you, have you, Bernie Charles? Here. Oh, thanks. <laughs> You're a real angel of mercy. Oh, sorry about the sugar beater. <laughs> Don't worry. I'm just glad you made it down in one piece. Oh, I almost didn't. <laughs> Nearly came a cropper on that ruddy barrage balloon. Yes. The skies are becoming a little crowded these days. Oh, rather. It's like Piccadilly Circus up there. <laughs> <laughs> we haven't been properly introduced. Squadron leader Gascoigne at your service. Gascoigne? Yeah, but my chums call me Louis. Louis Gascoigne? I say, you're all right. You've gone as white as a sheet. I'm... I'm fine. <laughs> you look like you've seen a ghost. <laughs> I didn't make you down alive, didn't I? Yes, of course you did. Oh, good. It's just Louis Gascoigne. I'm sorry, but... Uh... Have we had the pleasure? I believe my mother knew your mother. Really? Oh, that's jolly. Who's your mother? My mother is, was, Sibella Holland. Nope, not ding-dong, any bells, that one. Sorry. Curious. 
Your mother never even mentioned her. Afraid not. But then Ma's never been much of one for social chit-chat. So, who are you? I'm Unity. Unity Holland? Yes. Oh, well, it's top hole to me, Unity Holland, no matter what sucks. So we sat back and got to know each other, lazing in the shadow of the enormous barrage balloons that hung above us like silver-lined clouds. So, tell me, Louis, what's it like up there? Terrific. The most scared I've ever been and the most alive I'll ever feel. But what's it like, killing people? Don't you think it's wrong? Shooting Jerry's? Of course not. It isn't like they wouldn't do it to me if I gave them the chance. Oh, I suppose not. <laughs> All the same. What? They are people. <laughs> and that, my dear little member of the weaker thing of me, is why I'm flying fighters whilst you're hoeing the weeds. <laughs> you soon learn that enemies aren't people. They're simply things in the way. You want to know the best thing about it? You can get away with murder up there. You're just, uh, above it all. That does sound rather wonderful. Yeah, it is. <laughs> Which is why I ought to start thinking about getting back up there. Because lovely as it's been lying here, having a chin wag and gazing into those rather luscious eyes of yours, <laughs> I really think it's time to go and face the music for pranging another hurricane. Can't you wait for oh. them to come and get you? Yeah, but no one knows I'm here, do they? No. I suppose they do. No, as far as the boys at Biggin are concerned, I'm, uh, I'm fish food at the bottom of the channel. What a thought. <laughs> so, how are we going to get me back? I know. Huh? How about I drive you on the winch truck? Topping idea. I should explain. Due to the threat of invasion, the skies above Dover were scattered with the huge silver blobs of the barrage balloons. They were winched aloft on the back of trucks one of which was conveniently parked on the very edge of the field. In spite of my being a member of the weaker of Thingamy, I managed to support him through the sugar beet and loaded him onto the back of the lorry. There you are. Now you lie still. You will drive carefully, won't you? It's just uh, I know what you women are like behind the wheel of a car. Oh dear, yes. You're right. I tell you what. Why don't I tie you onto something? Like... The cable of the balloon. Excellent. Now that's what I call thinking. Now, uh, we'll slip that onto there. Yeah. And clip this uh, onto your belt. Uh -huh. Like that. Oh, mind my leg. Uh, sorry, did I hurt you? No, 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 not at all. Good, we wouldn't want that. <laughs> oh, there. So, am I safe? As houses. Unless... Unless... Someone were to pull the release lever. What release lever is that, then? This release lever. Oh, that release lever. I see. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but no one's going to pull the... Uh, I say, hang on. <laughs> Unity! <laughs> Unity! I set free a balloon from a field in Kent. Lord alone knows where it went. Two weeks later, the London Times carried the report of the tragically heroic death of squadron leader Louis Philip Francis, first heir to the title Earl of Chalfont. It was assumed that he had been shot down, whereas I knew that actually he'd shot up. Rather rapidly, too. My path was now set, and there could now be no turning back. The newspaper had mentioned that the succession had passed to Louis's younger brother, Henry. He was described as an enterprising London businessman. And I had a shrewd idea of just the kind of business it was that Henry would be in. I heard that Coventry's been getting a terrible paste in the past couple of weeks, Lily. Well, if it gives us a breakdown here, and they do say Birmingham's going to cop it next Oi, oi, you two. Keep it under your hat. Haven't you heard? Careless talk costs lives. Ooh. Hark at Winston Churchill. Hmm. <laughs> Sorry about them, madam. Can I help you? Oh, I do so hope you can. You see, I've got my shopping list here, but so far I haven't been able to find a single thing on it. Oh, well, let's have a little look-see, shall we? Oh, butter, sugar, eggs, bacon, blimey! Uh, uh, you have got your coupons? Well, no, I'm terribly afraid that I haven't. But I have got plenty of money. Money's no good without coupons, is it? You do know there's a war on. Yes, I'm only too well aware of that. My husband's just... <laughs> oh, you all right, dear? You've had some bad news. <laughs> My poor dear Louis. Oh, in the army, was he? He was a pilot. Oh. A hurricane pilot. Oh. And now <laughs> I'm just so lost without him. 
<laughs> Arthur Moorfield. What? You help this poor girl out right oh, now. Her husband was a hero. We owe them boys. No, please. I couldn't ask anyone to do anything wrong on my behalf. Oh, bless the girl. Well, Arthur. Oh, uh, well, um, you said you had some money. Yes. Louis is, was an earl. <laughs> You see, there oh. you see, she's a turtled lady. <laughs> she can't be expected to know nothing about your ruddy coupons. You're right. <laughs> well, madam, m, m lady, if you come back after I've shut up shop, I'll see if I can't find a little something for you. You know, uh, off the coupon, as it were. <laughs> then I should think so, too. You're right. And so my quest to track down Henry Gascoigne had led me to the murky world of the wartime black market. Poor Mr. Morphill. I'm sure he had no idea just what he was taking on when he took pity on me. Patty de foie gras? Just where the blood and stomach pills am I supposed to get that from? I really wouldn't know. But you are so clever at that sort of thing, aren't you? <sighs> and you see, I'm having a little tea party and the Duchess of Argyle is coming and she's so very partial to it. Now listen, milady, I do really think that this has all gone far enough. Yes, I suppose you're probably right. Because, as you keep reminding me, Mr. Morphill, were anyone in authority ever to discover what you've been selling to me for profit, and without coupons or anything, it would go very bad for you. For me? Now, now look here a moment. But, of course, were you to tell me where to find these nice things? Trust me, milady, you do not want to know where these things come from. Try me. And so it was that I found myself in the offices of the enterprising London businessman himself. The saloon bar of the Crown and Two Chairman Public House. Henry Gascoigne. Depends who's asking. May I sit down? It's a free country. Until the invasion, that is. Drink? I could do a Guinness. Let's try this instead. Mm. <laughs> Cheers. Cheers. Mmm, blimey. That's pucker scotch. Where did you get it? I know a man. Lucky you. Luck has nothing to do with it. Have another. Don't mind if I do. You're rather glad-handed with that scotch. I have a lot of it. Mm. Which is why I'm looking for someone who can help me. Drink it. Sell it. When you say a lot of it. <laughs> 36 cases. 36? Think you can handle it. Me? I wouldn't know what you're talking about. Let's cut the workers' playtime out, shall we, Henry? Petrol, oil, cigarettes and whiskey. It's your specialty. Are you a copper? Do I look like I'm a copper? I'm just someone who likes to know who I'm dealing with. And you think you're dealing with me, do you? Let's have another drink and find out, shall we? Hmm. So how is it you're not in the army? Got a bad heart, haven't I? So is everyone these days. <laughs> yes, but I was lucky enough to know a couple of chaps on the board. You didn't want to do your bit? No point. You don't think we can win? Win? Of course we're going to win. We're very good at winning wars. It's what we do, we British. But what then? Hmm? I'll tell you something. When this shooting match is all over, then the real war will start. And it won't be the soldiers fighting. So who will it be? Us. The businessmen. Here's to us. Hmm. Oh, this is top-notch scotch. Can you shift it for me? Well... If you can't handle it, I'm sure I can find someone who can. Uh, I'll hold your horses, sister. I can, I can shift it. As your man says, it's my specialty. But it's a 50-50 deal. 70-30. 60-40. Don't ask me why I was haggling over imaginary whiskey with a dead man. The whole charade had clearly gone to my head. But we struck a deal, and he gave me directions to a lock-up garage somewhere in the depth of Bermondsey, where I was to meet him the next morning with my imaginary consignment of top-notch scotch, which gave me just one night to ponder how to be rid of Henry Gascoigne. Wartime was so frustrating for a would-be lady assassin. There were grenades, mines, phosphorus bombs, but as usual, it was the boys who had all the toys. However... What I lacked in high explosives, I made up for in bent hair clips and feminine ingenuity. Which was all I needed to gain access to Henry's lockup. <clears throat> there were cans of petrol. 
drums of heating oil, cartons of cigarettes and all manner of hooch, stacked floor to ceiling. And I was struck by the happy thought of how remarkably incendiary it all was. I set to soaking the place with petrol. Then I taped a book of matches to the door, so that when it was opened, the match heads would scrape against the brick lintel and ignite. Having managed to evade overseas service for his country, it seemed to me the very best Henry Gascoigne could do was to keep the home fires burning. I was halfway back to tooting when I heard that Henry had arrived for our appointment in this world and his appointment with the next. In the midst of life, we are in death. Henry Arthur Kitchener Gascoigne has joined his gallant brother Louis at the side of the Lord. And so we commit his earthly remains to the family vault. Or rather, we would if there were any left. Poor mother. First Louis and now Henry. It's almost as though this family is cursed. Of course it's cursed. The whole ruling class of this entire stinking system is cursed. Cursed and about to be swept into the dustbin of history. M mark my words, young Ron. It'll be a democratic workers' utopia. The old order will be f will be f finished. So it's not a twisted hand of supernatural evil that curses any Gascoigne heir apparent to a violent early death. Afraid not. It's just the inevitable march of history. Poor dear Mama. I don't think her constitution can take any more tragedy. The constant tragedy of her life is the only pleasure left to poor dear Mama. Oh, I say. Excuse me, miss. Are you all right? Yes. I'm sorry. Do forgive me. No, no, no. That's, uh, that's quite all right. You were at the... You were at the service. Service? Weren't you? Yes. I'm sorry if I intruded on a private family occasion. No, no, not at all. Henry was only our half-brother. Yeah, and h hardly even that. You knew him? Yes. He was a friend of mine. Oh, you <laughs> poor thing. I'm so sorry. He really wasn't that bad. Oh, oh uh, no. Duke didn't mean it like that. D didn't I? No. No, you didn't. Uh, uh, we're both very sorry if you're upset by his loss. Oh, thank you. But I'm sure I'll survive. Somehow. Oh, that's the spirit, Miss, um... Please, call me Unity. Unity? <laughs> what a wonderfully poetic name that is. Well, I'm Ronald, and um, this is my half-brother, Duke. The Duke? Mm, mm, Mama Duke, please don't call me by the nonsensical inherited title of the un unworthily p p privileged... Yes, sorry about his sense of humour. He doesn't have one. I, I, <laughs> we were just going to have some tea. I, I, Would you I, I, care to join us? Do. And so it was that I was finally invited into my rightful family home. More t t tea, Unity? A sandwich, Unity? Thank you. Will Lady Edith Gascoigne not be joining us? Mother will have taken to her room to mourn. She takes her mourning very seriously, does Mother. I'm afraid, Unity, Gascoigne's are rather dab hands at tragedy. Young Ron here is desperate to put it down to a family c c curse. A dark hound of doom who will stalk us all to our destruction. It's a far more poetic proposition than the dreary march of socialism. <laughs> Don't you think? H have a care, Ron, or come the glorious day, I'll make sure you're first up against the... Wall. You wouldn't do that to your own half-brother. No, of course he wouldn't. I'd be third up after Adalbert and Uhtred. <laughs> this family is so complicated. I've never given it much thought. Isn't yours? I have no family. <laughs> Lucky you. <laughs> Unity, ignore him. Are you all alone in the world? Yes. I suppose you could say I am. Then I'd say you should join our family. If only that were not a fate I wouldn't wish on anyone. <laughs> 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 ah. You are terribly sweet, Ronald. Unfortunately, these young Gascoigne's were both delightfully likeable fellows. For the moment, I was happy to enjoy their company. And so, 
Where are the twins today? I'm afraid they're both p prisoners of war. In Germany? In Pentonville. But they would be conscientious objectionables if they'd been given the chance. Duke here was invalided out in Catalonia. In 37. International Brigade. And young Ronald here is in a reserved occupation. I'm a poet. <laughs> I thought it was a poet's duty to die heroically in Flanders' fields. Th th that's what I c keep telling him. Go, die a young man's death and save the world from all your dreadful poems. <laughs> I'm a clerk at the Ministry of Aviation. I would have served, only Mother insisted otherwise. She does rather worry about losing too many of us. Maybe with some reason. Really, Duke? Don't say you're starting to believe in my dark house. <laughs> 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 of course, I'm not. And don't call me d d d Duke. I say, Unity, won't you stay for supper? Why, that would be wonderful. Yes. Yes, it would. So, you were a friend of... Or Henry's, were you, Miss Sum? Um... Unity. Unity. <laughs> Very singular name. Uh, yes, Mother. It's uh, it's her only one. Do be quiet, Ronald. Yeah. Your parents, Miss Sum? Um... Hallward. Hallward. They are both dead. Are they really? Well, how very unfortunate for you. Or not. Marmaduke. Really. <laughs> So, what did your father do? My father didn't do anything, Lady Edith. Oh, I'm very pleased to hear it. <laughs> the best men don't. Uh, more ham, Unity? Why, thank you, Ronald. As the long, cold winter of 1945 slowly thawed and brought in the spring, it was a golden time of long walks picnics, and lying under the weeping willow tree with young Ronald. For perhaps the first time I was almost happy, in spite of his poetry. And the mules of Shelley, Keats, and Byron are silenced in the cacophony of the air raid siren as the puking screams of the dying fill the velvet air and spatter across the canvas of my black and desperate, dark and desolate grim despair. And you're dedicating that one to me, are you? <laughs> Do you like it? It's very sweet of you, Ronald. <laughs> can I ask you something, Unity? Of course you can. What's it like being poor? Having no family and no position in the world? Why are you asking me? Well, because you have no family. You told me so yourself. And I've always assumed that you are poor because you never have very much money, which I've always been led to believe is a, one of the prerequisites of poverty. It certainly helps. So, what's it like? Poverty has little to recommend it. Oh. <laughs> I think I would do very well as a pauper. It would do wonders for my poetry. Would it? Oh, without a doubt. It's fearfully hard writing poetry in comfort. If only I could relieve you of the burden of your terrible wealth while somehow retaining my own creative penury. Now you're making fun of me. If I make fun of you, it's only because you talk like a total ass. You think so? Do you think I wouldn't give up everything for something I loved? Because I tell you, I'd do it in a heartbeat. You are a sweet boy, Ronald. And now you patronize me. Only because you're talking like a total ass. It's not the way the world is. Well, maybe it's about time the world changed. Now you're talking like Duke. I... What on earth's that? It's St. Uhtred's. <laughs> what are they ringing the bells for? The world had changed that sunny day in May. Germany had surrendered, which meant that Adalbert and Uhtred Gascoigne would come home to claim their estates. It was time to get back to work. Because the twins and I had crossed paths before, I resolved to keep my distance from Chalfont until I had some sort of plan worked out. However, young Ronald soon began making frantic pleas for me to visit him. Terrified that he was about to start bombarding me with poems, I relented. Unity, I'm so glad you're here. It's been years. It's been months, Why, it's Ronald. it's felt like years. 
You must solemnly promise never, ever to leave me here alone at Chalfont for so long again. I didn't think you'd want me around while you welcomed your brothers back home. And what's all this about being alone? Where's Duke? Banished. What for? For telling the twins they must renounce the title and turn the estate into a workers' collective farm. Which didn't go down well? Oh, you could say that. It's the only thing the wretched pair have agreed on since they arrived. For the last time, Uted. I'm Adelbert. No, you're not. I am. And it is a plain matter of family history that Adelbert was born some seven and a half minutes before his younger brother, Uhtred. That is quite correct. Ah, you admit it. Of course I do, Uhtred. Damn it, I am not Uhtred. I am Adelbert. Tell him, Ronald. Tell him, Ronald. I'm keeping out of this. Oh, Unity, let's take a walk. I could do with some clear air. I don't understand. What's happened? The twins are having an identity crisis over who will inherit when Mother snuffs it. Surely the eldest will. Who is the eldest? Adelbert. But that's the problem. They've always been so identically obnoxious. Surely someone can tell them apart? Not a snowball's chance. And now they've got a sniff of the title. They're both of them claiming to be Adelbert and denying furiously that they ever answer to the name of Uhtred. Something's got to be done. Absolutely. It's poison. It might work. What? You said poison? Yes, the atmosphere between them. It's total cyanide. Yes, of course. Well, it would be. They're not still up to their fascist thing, are they? No, even they've realised that's a bit uh, out of favour. So now they've got a new kick. Which is? British unionism. It's pretty much business as usual, but this time no one's got a moustache. Oh, and they're not a double act now. Just last week, one of them, Adelbert, or Adelbert, held a political rally in the village hall. <laughs> Good people of Chalfont, I am Adelbert Gascoigne, and if you care about this land fit for heroes, join my new and improved British Union movement. Good neighbours, people of Chalfont, do not listen to this man. He is an imposter. I am Adelbert Gascoigne. Oh, no. Oh, yes, I am. And I tell you, reject him and his tired, outdated British Union movement and join me, Adelbert Gascoigne, in my movement of British Unionists. No, stop the movement, I say. Up the BUM! The twins have been in a state of all-out war ever since. Oh, the way things are going. Do you know, they could kill each other. What a thought. They might try, but I couldn't trust them to do it properly. So that afternoon, I typed two identical notes. Uptred. For that, that is, is who, who you know you are. As you appear determined to thwart me in my rightful succession, I demand satisfaction on the field of honour. Let us duel to the death with pistols. Unless you admit now that you're too much of a baby, meet me at midnight on the croquet lawn. Your elder brother... Adelbert. One note slipped under each bedroom door, and I made my way to the croquet lawn and waited for the appointed hour. I say, you there, what's your name? Me? Yes, you. What are you doing here? Bird watching. At midnight? I'm very fond of owls. Well, it's lucky you're here. We've got a job for you. We need a second. Really? Yes. My younger brother and I are in dispute. That is exactly the sort of remark that a callow youth would make. One way or another, he must be taught respect for his elders and betters. So, we have resolved to do it here, on this field of honour. You're going to play croquet? We are going to duel with these pistols. And you are to act as second. I see. And what do I have to do exactly? You have to take and load the guns. Well, go on. Very well. If I must. Then count our steps as we walk ten paces from each other. You then give the command. And we turn and fire. Get it? Got it. Good. Now, have you got those pistols loaded? Yes. All ready. Then come on, girlie. Let us have it. With pleasure. In the midst of life, we are in death. It could not have been easier. The law quickly decided it was a mutual murder. 
the assumption being that each twin had tried to circumvent the accepted rules of dueling and gone for the sneaky underhand kill. For anyone who knew them, this was a highly plausible explanation. I was now four down, and only three to go. Lady Edith. Miss Allward. I cannot say how upset I am for you. No, I'm starting to believe that you cannot. If there's anything I can do... I have no doubt have... that you will try to do it. It may have been my nerves, but there was something unsettling about Lady E, and I wouldn't be sorry to see her go. But what was causing me disquiet were the two other obstacles still in my way. I had become dangerously attached to them both. Obviously, Marmaduke would follow his principles and renounce the title. However, that would leave me with having to remove Ronald from the scene, the mere thought of which caused me deep and genuine distress. And so... I resolved the only thing to do, reader, was to marry him. I rushed down to Chalfont immediately. M Miss Hallward. Oh, hello, Marmaduke. I didn't know you were expected. Do you have an appointment? An appointment? Hello, Unity. <laughs> I was just congratulating the next Earl of Chalfont. Who? Who, who, who do you think? Oh, honestly, Duke, don't be such a booby. How dare you? I am to be an earl, not a duke. But you can't be. And <laughs> just why not? Because. Of your principles, perhaps. Renouncing the t title is just what the vested interests of the British aristocracy would like someone like me to do. But you've just joined the British aristocracy. And I shall work for its overthrow from inside its ranks. Dash it all, Duke. You're a Labour man. So what? The Labour Party's finished. Act is a, a complete disaster. Well, I'm shocked. Forgive me for saying it, but it's really none of your business. It's family. Now, leave us. Yes. Of course. I see. Unity. I'll leave you to your family, Ronald. But don't worry, I'll be sure to see you again soon. And I made very sure that I did, under our weeping willow tree. Look at him. Is that...? Marmaduke, yes, that's him. Riding to hounds? Ch changing the system from within, according to him. Do you know what he started doing? What? Setting man traps. What? Man traps in the woods, with the poachers. He's reverting to type. When I was growing up here, ignored by mother, tormented by the twins, Duke was the only one that was kind and human and... Now I've lost him. He's become a Gascoigne. Ronald, dearest, I'm so sorry. You wouldn't believe what Gascoigne's are capable of. I think I would. We would commit cold-blooded murder if anyone got in our way. Ronald? Dear Ronald... Unity, are you cold? Here, have my coat. No. Hmm? Please, hold me. Hmm. Unity. Hmm? Who's Sibella? Sibella? Yes. I overheard Mother talking with Marmaduke the other day. She said that she thought you were a daughter of Sibella. I went into the library and tried looking her up. I thought she might have been one of those mad old Greek birds like Clytemnestra or Medea. You know, the ones who went about starting wars and avenging things. And is she? No. I couldn't find any mention of her. But whoever she is, they don't like her terribly much. And, darling Unity, I know it's hateful of them, but Mother and Marmaduke have decreed that you're no longer welcome at the house. I see. I'm so sorry. I argued with them, but look, there's absolutely nothing I can do. Don't worry. But can I still see you? Of course you can. Hmm. But first, there's something that I have to do. Let me help you. No. It's something I have to do on my own. I took to stalking the vicinity of Chalfont, hunting Marmaduke. However, fortunately for both him and me, he had taken to his bed with a severe head cold, contracted whilst personally overseeing the eviction of the local widow into the snow. 
He was not to be seen out and about again until the morning of the midwinter hunt meeting. And that was when the idea struck me. In a perfect moment of malevolent inspiration, I knew how another enemy would be cleared from my path. I hurried back home to see an old friend in Tooting. Two pints of essence Dionese? What the blooming Henry is that then? It's aniseed. Oh. I'm making some sweets for some poor darling children who've gone the entire war without any. Mm, sweets is still on the ration, your ladyship. I know they are, Miss Morphil, but then you and I have never let little things like that trouble us, have we? And I only want to help the children. That's a lot of balls. Sorry? A lot of aniseed balls that you're making, you know, with two pints. There are a lot of children. It's horrible stuff, you know. Mind you, dogs love it, they say. Go mad for it, they do. Yes, so I hear. Once I had taken delivery of two pints of aniseed essence, so beloved of children and hounds, I hurried immediately down to Chalfont. I crept into the tack room where Marmaduke kept his hunting pinks and soaked the scarlet jacket <coughs> with the pungent oil. <coughs> Francis! B bring the hounds round now, damn it! I slipped into the shadows. Where's my coat? Bloody cold. Is the death of me. How right he was. He'd never lived to know. <sighs> I fought to control my pounding heart as I watched him dress. What's he done with my flask? If he turned and caught me, all my plans would be done for. <sighs> as I lurked in the gloaming, watching my victim, I swear that there was nothing I desired more. Bella. To stop the madness to which I had been enthralled for too long. I had almost decided to do it. Speak out and foil my own murderous ambitions when completely oblivious to his aniseed odour. Francis! Francis! Marmaduke turned and marched out. Let loose the... Oh. Oh. What the, the devil have you letting him do? Francis! Francis! Ah. Down, Mark! Down! Eggers! No! Come on, No! No! It's not to get to the man of me! Help! Ah. 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 Marmaduke Gascoigne may have been unspeakable but he certainly wasn't uneatable. There could be no doubt now in Lady Edith's mind as to who I really was. She shut herself away in her room, and I had half a reason to hope that the grief of Marmaduke's rather horrible demise would do for her, but it turned out she was determined to do for me. She was a Gascoigne, after all. Yes? Hello, can I help you? Miss Holland? Yes? Miss Unity Holland. What can I do for you? I'm Chief Inspector Sterling of Scotland Yard. Oh, I see. You'd better come in. Uh, no, madam. You had better come out. Unity Holland, I am arresting you for the murder of Lady Edith Gascoigne. It was brilliant. A masterstroke. Once she knew who I was and worked out what I had done, Lady Edith also realised that there was not one jot of evidence against me. And so, with the ruthless single-mindedness of a Gascoigne, she set about manufacturing some, linking me to the murder of herself. She poisoned a bottle of claret, which she then had sent to herself from Tooting, enclosing the note that I had sent to her along with poor mother's photograph all those years previously. I beg, as you drink this, that you think of my poor dead mother. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, there can be no doubt what this note written in the hand of the accused means. Of course, poor sweet Ronald was dragged into court. Did you have a close, affectionate relationship with the accused? Uh, well, I mean, um, I suppose, uh, yes, we did. And had she just been banished from visiting you at Chalfont Castle by your mother, Lady Edith? Uh, well, yes, but... Uh, no she... further questions. However, it was all fairly circumstantial. Until... Please state your name. Arthur Livingston Stanley Rhodes Mafeking Moorfield. 
And you keep a grocery shop in Tooting? I do. A uh, grocery and dry goods, sir. And you are acquainted with the accused, Miss Holland? Oh, yes, I know her, all right. She is a customer in your shop. You could say that. I was clearly not Mr. Morfield's only customer. It soon became apparent that Lady Edith also used his services, and I can only assume that she paid him better than I did. Mr. Morfield, I must ask you to be completely truthful with the court. Did you ever supply the accused with illicit items? That is to say, ration goods that had been procured from what is commonly known as the black market. To my everlasting shame, I must admit that I did. Your candor does you credit, sir. Now, will you please tell the court what items you procured for the accused on the 8th of August this year? I got her a bottle of claret wine and some arsenic. <sighs> and did she tell you why she wanted claret wine and arsenic? Oh, yes, she did. She said she wanted to rid her house of vermin. <laughs> The act he put on in the witness box, clearly at Lady Edith's posthumous behest, was worthy of Olivier, Richardson and Gielgud, all rolled up into one magnificent tragic performance. Tragic, as it turned out, for me. All Lady Edith Gascoigne had to do to seal my fate was to drink the poison. Gentlemen of the jury, have you reached a verdict on which you are all agreed? We have, Your Honour. And how do you find the accused? We find her guilty. <gasps> it was a mighty sacrifice, but one she obviously thought worth making. She shall be taken from this place to the place from whence you came, and from there to a place of lawful execution, where you shall be hanged by the neck until you are dead. And may the Lord have mercy on your soul. <laughs> Ronald. Don't say anything. You don't need to say anything, Unity. We haven't got very long left together. Why did you come here, Ronald? To this horrid place? I had to see you one last time and tell you that I know why you did it. Ronald. And I know who you did it for. Ronald, please listen to me. No, no, no. It's not your fault. None of it is your fault. I did try to warn you about my family. Or rather, our family. I should have told you. I'm glad you didn't. I don't think I could have loved you if I'd known you were one of us. The Gascoigns destroy everything that crosses them. We never stood a chance. Please think of me in the morning. Unity, I will think of you for the rest of my life. Now, you're not to worry. Keep my chin up. Something like that. Goodbye. Unity Gascoigne. And there it is. The unhappy and it would appear a naturally short life of Unity Gascoigne. I would write more, but I can see the sun rising on the longest day of summer and what I fear is to be the shortest day of my year. And I have visitors to entertain. Good morning, gentlemen. Heavens, is that the time? I am very much afraid it is, madam. Are you ready? Do I have a choice, Governor? Have you made your peace with your maker? I think so. But anything I've forgotten, I'm sure I can take up with him personally over breakfast. Then let us proceed. Stop! Sir! What? There's a letter. Will you excuse me, Miss Gascoigne? Please don't hurry on my account. Good Lord. Miss Gascoigne, it is my happy duty to inform you that the Home Secretary received this letter some 30 minutes ago which appears to provide conclusive proof that you are an innocent woman. It's been a long time since anyone called me that. But who in earth... Lady Edith's own son. Ronald! The new Earl of Charfont has confessed to coercing you to procure the claret wine and the arsenic on his behalf. No. Yes. He tells how it was he who poisoned the wine and gave it to his mother in a rage after she banished you from Charfont. But the note... He says it was sent from you to him some months previously and that he must have dropped it in his mother's room after he had tampered with the bottle. He cannot do this. He has done it, madam. He says you have tried to protect him, but he cannot have your innocent death on his conscience. I must speak with him. Uh, 
I am afraid you will not be able to do that. This letter of his, it is, um, well, rather in the form of a suicide note. No! Catch her! <sighs> Miss Gascoigne, are you with us? Against all expectation, I do appear to be. Forgive me, Governor. Not at all, dear lady. A shock, it's quite natural. <sighs> But you are now free to go, without a stain on your character. Thank you. But before I go, there is something I must not forget to take with me. I am Unity, Countess, Lady Gascoigne of Chalfont, truly my father's daughter in all respects but one. Unlike dear Papa... I am careful not to leave my personal papers lying around after me. So I gathered my memoir, left that prison, and came here, to this rather more comfortable one instead. I often go and lie under the weeping willow, where I spent so many long and happy hours with Ronald, where he told me... Do you think I wouldn't give up everything for something I loved? Because I tell you, I'd do it in a heartbeat. I did always make the mistake of underestimating my fellow Gascoigns. I'm so sorry, Ronald. You were right. There was a dark hound of doom stalking the family. And now, as a titled lady of both affluence and influence, I do not lack suitors, but they are none of them suitable, and I am resolved that I shall not marry. And as for children, I think I may adopt... In Kind Hearts and Coronets, like Father Like Daughter by David Spicer, Alistair McGowan played the entire Gascoigne family, and Natalie Walter played Unity. The other parts were played by Simon Greenall, Steve Hodson, David Holt, Sally Oreck, and Jane Whittenshaw. The broadcast assistant was Philippa Gearing, and Mr. McGowan's stunt double was Jason Devoy. Sound was by Chris O'Shaughnessy and Wilfredo Acosta, and it was directed by Frank Sterling at Unique for BBC Radio 4. And tomorrow here on BBC Radio 4 you can hear a dramatisation of Virginia Woolf's classic novel set on a single day in June when lives interweave on the streets of London as the high society lady Clarissa Dalloway makes her final preparations for an important party. That's the first part of the classic serial Mrs Dalloway tomorrow afternoon at three. Now, before Francis Fifield examines Benjamin Britten's The Young Person's Guide to the Orchestra in Tales from the Stave, here's Jane Garvey looking ahead to Weekend Woman's Hour. This woman took her son to an appointment to be shot. I know it's bad. Maybe some people say, how could I do what I did? Sometimes I feel as if I'm not a good mother, but I try my best. My son's there. He's alive. Um, he got off lately. All it was was just... Something had had to be done to try to save him. Hear more of that incredible interview on Weekend Woman's Hour at four o'clock. Before that, on BBC Radio 4, Frances Fifield returns for another series of her forensic musical investigations, Tales from the Stave. She begins with the most recent and exciting addition to the British Library's rich archive of handwritten manuscripts by British composers, Benjamin Britten's A Young Person's Guide to the Orchestra. Many of you may have heard and seen a full symphony orchestra playing in the concert hall. But today, I want to take this great musical box to pieces, show you the various instruments, and let you hear their own particular sound. I first played this piece in the National Youth Orchestra and it made a tremendous impression on me. Ruth Rostrum, viola player and handwriting analyst. As with the orchestra...